What do you usually like pull out of this creek? Usually catch a few coon and uh, some rats. Yesterday, I think there we have a good chance of catching some coon today. I think. Yeah. You ever pull any mink out here? So do you mark them at all or you just know where you... I've seen all my stakes on Something down there. Here, I set this trap right here because you can see where muskrats have been chewing up on the bank, eating some roots. We even got some tracks up here where they've been going up and down. And then on my last trap, I always put some kind of marker with some orange flag, and that way I know I'm to the end. I like to use one and a half coil springs. They seem to hold the best. A little bit more weight for catching the rat. It, uh, it dispatches them quicker. And that's heavy enough, usually they drop yeah. in and drown. I like to put my chain as tight as I can, put the stake as far out into the water where that chain is directly straight into the bank. So when I catch that rat, he swims out here, he gets tangled up, and he'll be, be done in no time. You can see where they come up here and sit. They're coming up here and getting their roots. Set that trap right at the base of the water there, and next day you might have one. So is roots uh, main part of their diet? I know this time we're... of the year it seems like they're eating a lot more roots. I like to try to trap nice, nice, pretty big creeks along cornfields. They seem to really be around cornfields. That gives them a lot of nutrition in the summer. And then the winter here, once they uh, get the fields out, they like to come down and eat on these root, root banks and make little nests. Right here is, I like to call a good mink spot. You can catch a lot of rats because you got this log here. And they can go up either side, so it's a great funnel. You set a trap right at the base of the water there. You can even see some, some footprints here where they come up here and eat or they just hang out and watch for predators. And then I set another trap on this side here. You got a nice bee funnel. Got the stake out as far as possible. Now we just got to wait for the rat to come through. Do you use mostly uh, the coil springs? Yes. Do you use any long? I have some long springs, but I'm switching over to the coil springs. They seem to set better with this tab here on them. And you got steep banks. You can take that tab and jab it in there, and make a nice little trap bed. With coil springs, they, you got to dig out and make a little shelf. Coil springs are just a lot faster. You can get a lot more traps set in a short amount of time. What did you come through last night? What do you use for uh, bait there? I use anything from cat food to stale cereal. Put a little fish oil around it. And a lot of times a coon comes through, he'll smell that sweet and go right in there. I like to start my trap line down, down current. That way when you're walking up, you can see the holes or you can see, see the better places for muskrats and it doesn't cloudy up the water. This is why I carry this stick long. You never know when you're going to find a hole. And it's no fun to get wet when it's 30 degrees outside. <laughs> All right, yesterday we set these traps here. You can see where I pull these weeds up and right there. He's right in them, uh, eating on them roots there. Set that trap right at the base of the water. That rat came swimming along last night to get him a meal. Look at there, we got some nice Nice size rat. Great back foot catch, quick dispatch. Are you trying to target back foot or does it does it matter? It I don't really target any foot. That's why I use these one and a halves. You got about a 
two inches there, even if you catch them by the front foot, it's going to catch them up way high, and you'll have a lot greater chance of having ring outs. When you say ring out, is that whenever they break their foot off? Yeah, that's when they'll, they'll, they'll chew their foot off here at the base, but if you catch them up high, you have a lot less chance of, catching, of them getting loose. Once I catch a rat, and sometimes it's worse than others, they'll be more dirtier. You want to try to get that fur as clean as possible, so I like to dip them in, shake them off, and then have them tailed down so that water can run right out of that fur. Give them a good shake, it helps start the drying process. Right, we're going to reset that trap, that's a good spot. Set it right just under the edge of the water there, ready for the next rat. So you got three stakes there, why? Is it a good spot? Well, you can see right here there's a nice nice bowl where they're going up there eating. Right here they're just climbing, chewing at the bank here a little. There's another spot here where they're just chewing. When I go down the creek, if I see any sign, I like to set it. That way about two checks, maybe three, depending on how many rats I'm catching. I pull and move down to the next area. Leaves a little seed for next year, and, and that way if some other trapper would happen to come through, he, there's a few left for him. There's another nice rat. A little bit on the smaller side, but that's all right. Again, wash him out, sling him around a little, get that water out of the fur, reset. Sometimes these one and a half can be a little strong, so you have to set them on the leg. You can see where they're going up in there. Might even be a little lodge up in there where they're living. How are you going to dispatch? I usually uh, tap them in the nose and then I can, once they're uh, out, then I can drown them pretty quick in the water. It's about the most efficient way and most humane way. That's what I use this stick for. Got it with a branch there on the V, knock them out, and you can drown them. Did you cut that green? Yes. Things about probably 10 years old. What's an indicator whenever it's uh, drowned enough? Once you start seeing bubbles coming out and he stops kicking, they have a very long, take quite a while. They can hold their breath for a very long time. Not dead? He a little. <laughs> Did he bite you? Might come crawling out of the pack here in a second. <laughs> I his legs scratch my hand, scared me. <laughs> I'd be scared too. They got some pretty good teeth on them. Yeah. But when I'm when I'm going down a creek like this, I usually take about ten trap stakes and ten traps, so then I can still walk and and not trip over everything. And then I can kind of scout it out and set them first ten traps. And if I need more, I'll just go back to the truck and get more. I think here I got about 25 traps. That's a good little run. Especially when I have to go back to work tomorrow. In the evening it gets dark pretty quick. It's not. It's a lot harder to check with a flashlight in the evening. Show the daily catch and different size. Males usually bigger than females. Those look like kids, you know. Yeah, these are probably this spring's. Call them kits. This here is probably a, he's a big male there. I always seem to find out the bigger the creek, the bigger the rats. You trap a small creek, you're going to catch small rats, just not the habitat there for them. This here is a pretty decent sized creek, so we got, usually catch pretty decent sized rats. This one here, he's an old granddad, though. That's, that's about as big as they come.
Dad came home Friday evening with 48 of them. So what do you got here? Just hog? No, just yeah. uh, hog rings? That's what we use to hang, uh, put beavers on the hoops. Yeah. But we don't, we pack them all on wood now, so we don't. You just hook them on their teeth or yep. what? Yep, hook them right on the front teeth. Just like this here. Hang them up, let them drip dry for a couple hours. Because when you stretch them, you always want the, you want the fur to be dry. Otherwise, it'll be, it'll look, the fur will look matted down. The fur will look higher quality if they're nice and dry and fluffy like this one here. This here is what I like to use to skin my muskrat. It's just an old PVC piece of pipe that I just zip tied to the pole. I cut me a little V notch here. And then I can hook that tail right in. Get him set on there, and then he's good to go. Turn him around, ready to, ready to skin. Helps to have a good sharp knife. Get that up out of the way. All right, I start by wringing each leg all the way around, and then I go to the. To the Hold on, let me get on this side. I like to go to the bottom side of this tail here. Basically right up the middle, down this side, pull it through. Same thing on this side. Hold that leg nice and straight, get you a good straight cut going across. Up on the tail a little bit, ring around the top of the tail. And then I always start going down the back side here. Separating the meat from the hide. Always cut along that white line there. Give it a little tug, you can see right where you need to cut. Come back around to the front side when you get skin halfway down the back. Get around these legs. Spin him back around. The front side here where the belly is, you gotta try to be a little more careful so the guts don't come flying out. A lot of times they still will, but the less mess you can make the better. Just makes it a little bit easier to skin. Get that, all them back legs skinned around them. Come down the back a little more, and we'll be ready to pull him through. Now you can grab onto him. Grab him by the chest and just pull him through. And you'll see them legs pop out. I like to just stick my thumb right through there and just pull it through. Same thing on this side. Now all we got left is the head. Once you get the legs pulled through, right past there, there should be some ears right there. Clipped him off. Another one right there. Pretty crucial to have small ear holes and small eye holes. Get too big of holes, good reason to be docked on the fur grading. Get a little past the ears and here come the eyes. You can kind of see them pop out at you as you're taking your knife along. Get them eyes, come right down through the, the cheeks. Come down over the nose. See the mouth starting to come through. Give a little pull. 
Cut the nose off and you got a skinned muskrat. Now it's time for the flushing. I just, this Ford here is probably from my uncles when they trapped 40 years ago. It's just a tapered board here, half inch thick, and I set it on a, I like to use a seven gallon bucket. That way you sit it up a little bit higher, and then I just sit on it, fling out the rat, make sure there's no more dust left in him, turn him inside out. String him on the on the board. I like to start with the with the top half first, and then I use this little flushing knife here. Just got a little curve to it, not very sharp. You don't have to get a whole lot off these muskrats. You just want to get the the globs of fat and then a the little bit of meat left on from skinning. So then I just start from about the head, work my way down, and then these saddles here, those you want to keep. I get the, the big chunks of fat off of them, work my way down, a little bit around the eyes here a little bit yet, along the base, and the top side's good. I try to do it in three, three strides. Do it half there. Get a little bit of this extra meat and fat on them saddles there. You get around to the belly side, there's a little more fat sometimes. Get down by the base where the tail was. Sometimes on the ears, there's a little left from skinning. That part's good. Do them on the third cycle here. Blobs. And that muskrat is ready to go on the stretcher. This is a muskrat stretcher here. I, I like to put all my muskrats on wire stretchers. All my other fur bearing animals I put on wood. Muskrats are just so quick. Just loop them over here. You want to make sure and get them straight on here. You get the eyes and ears on one side of the stretcher, and you get the feet on the other side. And then I always take a uh, clothespin and put a clothespin right over the nose. When you go to pull him tight, he stays on there. Hook this front side, just hook him down at the base here. Give him a little tug. Pull them over to this side, hook in on at the base, and then uh, I always try to pull down these sides, get them even, because when they go to grade, they'll measure from the tip of the nose to the shortest point on the sides here. So you always want to try to get them sides pulled down nice and, and even, and then these saddles here on the side, I push them up, make them look nice and pretty, so it looks pretty real good and uniform. And that's how you uh, skin and flush and stretch a muskrat. You hang all your uh, pelts nose down? Yep. That way, well, it just works out best on the stretcher on these nails yeah. here. Once their muskrat's dry, take the clothespin off. Loosen up your sides. What are you looking for, dryness? You'll be able to feel they'll turn real dark. They'll just look dried. And then they get pretty hard. Nothing will collapse in when you take it off the stretcher. Muskrat will stay just like that. You can tell he's got a little bit of grease. You just take a rag and wipe that off. Muskrats don't have a whole lot of grease. Coons and, and beaver get a little more grease. Well, this one's ready to be sold. Alright, as you can see we've had a pretty good year so far trapping muskrats. I really enjoy trapping them because they're about the easiest thing to catch. If you've got, if you've got a sign of them, you know, you just set a few traps in two days, you can be moving them. There's, as you can see, they're real easy to skin, flesh, and put up, and uh, they're just a lot of fun. You can catch a lot of rats in a couple days. I think a lot of people get their start trapping yeah. muskrats because, you know, it is easy, you know. Yeah if you got a water source that they're in. I started about 12 years ago 
I, I found and bought eight traps in my grandpa's uh, old house. And uh, his neighbor there was, was trapping, and I followed him around one day. I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And so uh, next year I started uh, trapping a couple rats. I think I caught two rats and a coon my first year. I sold my rats and just kept growing my, my trap collection from years after that. Now my dad and I were up to about 200 traps we run at a time. Catch quite a few rats in a year if, if, there's, if there's sign. Some years are better than others. Do you notice a, a big... Uh... <clears throat> I don't know when you ever, when you see a big boom in population, do you do you tie that with something throughout the summer? Um, well, like this year, I haven't seen near as many rats. We had some really heavy spring rains early summer, and uh, early and in the spring we had several big rains. And a lot of times that uh, them rains, that's right when the, the muskrats are having little ones, and, and it'll drown them out when we get when we get banked full of creeks and. And it stays up for a couple of days. That really hurts the population. I think this year that's why the population is down. The last two years, actually, we've had some heavy early summer and spring rains. And uh, and anymore, the, the farmers are straightening out a lot of the creeks. They're just not the habitat for them that there used to be. You have to go a lot farther and trap a lot more area to catch big numbers. So you got a dough hanging you got to work up now? Yep. Got a nice dough yesterday morning. Run my traps this morning, and now I got meat to cut up this afternoon. Make sure you rub a little muskrat grease on yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome.